Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the next installment of the Big Data to Knowledge Guide to the Fundamentals of Data Science. Uh, this is Mark Mewson from Stanford University, and I have the pleasure of introducing today's speaker, who is uh, Professor Isaac Kahane from the Harvard Medical School. Uh, Dr. Kahane has a distinguished career. He's currently the founding chair of the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Harvard, uh, and has a long history of working in uh, areas that range from the molecular to the population level. Uh, he is probably best known most recently for his work as the uh, guy who led the development of I2B2, which is a major uh, resource which is now used at over 120 academic health centers and around the world as a way of managing both clinical and molecular data. We know that in the world of big data, we talk about volume, velocity, and variety, and clinical data have all of that, and it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Zach to give today's talk. So uh, thank you very much. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. This, my name is uh, Isaac Kohane. I am uh, called by most people Zach, and I'm glad to talk to you today about considerations for, uh, uh, of clinical data for precision medicine. Before I go further, I just want to just check with my organizers that you can see my slide that looks like the precision medicine slide and that you can hear me. It looks good. Good. Thank you. So this is a slide just uh, to remind you uh, what precision medicine uh, was about, at least what we think it's about for those of us, as I was privileged to be, who are members of the National Academy of Science Committee that uh, helped write the uh, Precision Medicine uh, Report. And in a nutshell, we uh, declared that we had uh, Google Maps Envy, uh, that as shown on the left of the screen, we saw that uh, by taking latitude and longitude and combining it with a variety of other uh, data types, namely, uh, for example, weather, um, pharmacies, uh, traffic, we would create an ecosystem, they created an ecosystem that now has everybody uh, engaged in applied geography uh, internationally. And we said that if we were to create a similar information commons that was centered around patients, that gave this multi-axial view of patients, not only in one study at a time whether from, uh, with regard to, let's say, environmental exposure or clinical signs and symptoms or the microbial uh, contents of your gut, but we brought that all together, we would hope to create a similar um, productive ecosystem by looking at each patient from a much more uh, well-rounded uh, perspective rather than the blocky uh, kind of categorical view that we have uh, currently in medicine. And so some of the points I will make in my comments today will be that most population genetics and clinical medicine is addicted to categorical diagnosis. And that addiction um, creates some false or wrongly uh, taxonomized disease, uh, diseases and makes social and commercial construction of disease likely, sometimes for good, sometimes for ill. It, I also want to make the point that clinical predictive accuracy does not imply shared physiology, and that disease overlaps demonstrates a fundamental problem which precision medicine and its um, approaches are trying to solve, and that clinical data can be used to lessen the confusion. I want to briefly show here a... Um, uh, some ROC curves from a paper I published uh, several years ago about using uh, a, the transcriptome of white blood cells in patients with autism to distinguish them from individuals who did not have autism. And the only reason I point this out is that these fairly good-looking um, uh, AUC curves for a brain disease, at least, as measured by blood transcription uh, caused me to be invited to another school in my neighborhood, the Harvard Law School. And when I uh, entered that meeting, I saw an individual who I was reminded that I, I thought I had seen him on TV, on 
network TV in the past week or two. And I couldn't figure out who he was. Uh, I just couldn't remember. And then it came back to me when he asked me the following question. Why are you trying to commit genocide on my people? And so this guy is Uri uh, Neman, who has uh, a form of autism. And he takes the view that a lot of these uh, efforts for diagnosing autism amount to trying to filter out uh, these individuals and eliminate them from our population, and therefore this constitutes a form of genocide. And I had a long discussion, but it really uh, it made me think about the diagnosis. And, but I would rather, instead of voicing my own comments, voice comments of a woman that uh, who was public about these on the web. And she said, I think when Ari talks about autism and I talk about autism, we're talking about people with different clusters of autism. I know he doesn't like the word cure. If my daughter would function the way Ari could, I would consider her cured, said Singer. I have to believe my daughter doesn't want to be spending time peeling skin off her arm. So the point here I'm making is this diagnostic label can actually mean a lot of different things to many different people, and therefore, when we use them, for example, to do a study of autism versus not autism, the nature of that label is going to determine how successful we are, just as doing a study of heart failure versus not heart failure would be very different if we focused it merely on heart failure due to atherosclerosis or all the heart failures, valvular, um, atherosclerotic, uh, genetic, uh, sorry, um, structural protein defects, or infectious, which it would be lumped into what the medievalists would call dropsy. And so in the precision medicine um, perspective, I think we have to become much more careful about how we label these things. And perhaps less controversial, but even more vivid of the uh, uh, vivid description of this is dwarfism, which is often caused by growth hormone deficiency. And although I have a PhD in computer science, I, I am trained in uh, pediatric endocrinology, and this is a group that endocrinologists have long been uh, concerned about because the social and physical um, challenges of being uh, quite short can be considerable. And therefore, it was a major breakthrough when endocrinologists discovered that they could uh, take uh, the pituitaries from 60,000 uh, cadavers and extract from these cadavers, uh, from these pituitaries, uh, the protein growth hormone, and then inject them into children with, who were going to be much less than five foot tall, and lo and behold, grew to above five foot uh, tall. The problem was that because it was the um, it was uh, extracted from the 60,000 pituitaries, the fact that there were a few individuals with Jakob Creutzfeldt disease, a slow virus, resulted in the deaths of several children from uh, this disease. And you can guess how those of us, uh, it's actually my pre the previous generation before me, felt about treating having treated these kids with the best of intent to bring them to normal height, feeling responsible for having uh, caused their death unintentionally. And that created, first of all, a lot of happiness when we came up with um, synthetic or uh, well, bacterially uh, derived recombinant uh, growth hormone that uh, worked extremely well uh, in making these children grow. But because of this, and I'll get back to it shortly, because of this, um, the pla place where I learned how to practice pediatric endocrinology, because they had the memory, personal memory, of this uh, Jakob Kreutzfeldt uh, episode, gave very low doses of growth hormone because they just felt that they needed to be conservative. Now, in the, in the modern genomic era, a work done by one of my former uh, one of my former fellows in pediatric endocrinology uh, and now esteemed colleague uh, Joel Horshorn ran this big study uh, called the Giant Study, and what he found was in 
the range of normal height, there is in the there are literally hundreds of genes, maybe 700 genes, that are quite informative of adult height. But each individual of each individual gene of those hundreds of genes bears variants that contribute only very very minutely to total height. So your overall height, from the perspective of these genes, is only influenced. Uh, a very, very little amount by each gene. And so this is unlike the diseases at the tails of the distribution of height, where extremely short stature is the cause of highly penetrant uh, small numbers of, of uh, mutations, sometimes a single mutation. Which raises the question, what do you call short stature? What do you call that diagnosis? When you have short stature and you're not growth hormone deficient, what do you call it? So it turns out, uh, for a variety of reasons, which I'll make apparent, uh, we call it idiopathic short stature. Now, why would you want to have a diagnosis of idiopathic short stature? I think just to label it, to be a good doctor. But it turns out that it's also useful because it's a diagnosis that um, pharmaceutical companies can use to drive um, the prescription of growth hormone because it may add one or two inches uh, to height. And they had a very useful biomarker called for that's shown here on the screen, which defines height with respect to a standard deviation score. And that's interesting, of course, because it means no, no matter how high the U.S. population will be, there'll always be people who are below that threshold and therefore will qualify. Which reminds me of a story uh, about 25 years ago when I was a fellow in training. Um, I had published, I, was, I had I'd submitted an abstract about how um, with our one-third of a dose of growth hormone, we were achieving height velocities and adult statures that looked just as good as that of the general population, uh, those treated with growth hormone, those with growth hormone deficiency who were being treated with growth hormone, and yet um, we're only using a third of the dose. And to make a long story sh sh short, I got a threatening um, phone call as a fellow uh, from the chief medical officer there, essentially threatening me to block my publications because she sat on the editorial board of many uh, endocrine journals. And this was an unforgettable lesson to me, that tied to a diagnosis and tied to these biomarkers around diagnoses are huge amounts of dollars. And so being able to assign a diagnosis is always, not always, is frequently going to be an issue not just of science but of finance. But also... I want to remind you that um, not only insurers or pharmaceutical companies, but even parents are going to push around the diagnosis. So here's a case uh, of a father who comes in with a five foot six child who's still growing, but he because he wants his um, son to be a athlete and perhaps um, a basketball player. He is willing to pay out of pocket the $45,000 a year it costs to uh, give growth hormone. And this raises a bunch of questions. A, how does this cause us to stretch our diagnostic uh, criteria? And uh, B, is the parent wrong? Is this actually a reasonable uh, uh, question and something that we will have to face a lot in the coming years? Next, I want to move on to, in this context of categorical diagnoses. What's the interaction between clinical annotations and genetics? And here we're looking at an interesting interaction between genetics and a categorical assessment of ethnicity or race and a categorical diagnosis. And it's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, for those of you who are not clinicians, uh, is a disease that you've actually heard of about because it occurs uh, it's been occurred. It, it's been reported in the uh, in newspapers when it famously caused 
unfortunately, an athlete to die suddenly on a basketball court. And what it is, is an inherited, well, not, oh, it's a genetic disease, sometimes inherited, that is also autosomal dominant. You only need one copy of the gene. And it can lead to heart failure, arrhythmias, obstructed blood flow, and sudden cardiac death. But the important, is, the important fact to uh, recall here is this is one in 500. And so um, my colleague and postdoc, uh, uh, Rajman Rai, uh, did a study where he looked at the National Heart Blood, Blood Institute's uh, ESP study, which used to be thought of as big data, but at 6,500 individuals, even with exomes, is not no longer considered to be large da big data. But if we had this disease at one in 500, that would uh, give you about that much red, uh, red as you see on that uh, little cartoon of those individuals. Whereas what Raj found was a lot more red in the population, that is a lot more hypertrophic cardiomyopathy than you expect for a one in 500 um, disease. And when he then looked into what was the ethnicity or continent of origin of those patients, in, of those patients what he found was the following an amazing overrepresentation, amazing overrepresentation of those individuals who are African American. And why is that? Well, it turns out that individuals, that they, those who had run the study, had in fact done what, what they were supposed to do, which is have ethnically match cases of the controls. So it's probably the case that all the controls were in fact Caucasian, and I think they sought to have Caucasian um, uh, or European ancestry uh, cases. But it turns out that, uh, for example, in one of the studies in Paris, they in included some individuals who were uh, from Algeria or from Algerian descent. And similarly in Boston, some who had some uh, relatives who were uh, not from Europe. And so what this means is that if you include in the cases individuals who are from, uh, a even who, are, who have recent uh, lineage to Africa, then you're going to make it such that they're going to have a lot of alleles that are just not present in the uh, Caucasian or European American controls, because most uh, because the Africa create uh, born in Africa were those few families that thousands of years ago emigrated from uh, Africa to Asia and Europe, but just a few families, and therefore the their representation of the African uh, genetic diversity was extremely. Uh, sparse. And therefore, when you do a case control study, and unbeknownst to you, you have a few individuals of African ancestry, of recent African ancestry in your um, cases, you will have this overrepresentation of these alleles, which actually have nothing to do with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And lest you think that this is a just a um, interesting statistical um, result shown here from a one of the leading laboratories of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are all those individuals who were actually mistakenly diagnosed as a result of this kind of uh, mistake. We published this, by the way, in the New England Journal of Medicine last summer. And so these African-American individuals were not only diagnosed and possibly treated, but because it's autosomal dominant, family members were also reached out to because, of course, if it's also autosomal dominant, a lot of family members will carry a putatively causal uh, variant. And unlike this lab, which 
went back and notified all the families, I'm not sure, it's hard to know, what, how many of the commercial labs have done likewise. But note what's happened here. Because of imprecision of a diagnosis, making asserting that the diagnosis is this unitary thing, and also asserting that this label of ethnicity is a unitary thing, we're making inferences which end up to be damaging. And it, it continues also with regard to the genetic part of the reductionism. So here we looked up in clinicaltrials.gov which studies are being looked at in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And there's this trial going, uh, under, undergoing that is open now. And if you look here in uh, group two, there is a group that is, has no clinical evidence of uh, ventricular hypertrophy, but has a mutation. So they have a completely normal looking heart, and you could be as young as 10 years, as 10 years old, and you'll be receiving this drug for years as, from, as a child, and you have no clinical evidence. And here's the kicker. Of course, if you um, don't develop disease, you're going to be considered a therapeutic um, success, where in fact, as I hope I just uh, suggested to you, you may merely be a mislabel. Now, it's prediction, the acid test of diagnoses. Often uh, in our papers, we like to say, well, if I'm able to predict this, that must mean that, and predict it rely, re reproducibly in multiple populations, perhaps I'm looking at something causal. And, I would, and that it relates in some fundamental way to diagnosis. I'd like to suggest that that's probably not the case. So just stare at this screen for a little bit and focus on the fact that this is a screen that was done by Griffin Weber, uh, looking at survival three years after uh, test done. This is specifically on white blood cell counts, but Griffin has done this, as you'll see, on hundreds of other tests. And what shows you is your chance of dying, if you're like me, between 50 and 69 years old, and you have a low white blood count between 12 a.m. and 8 a.m., your chance of dying is greater than 50% in the next three years. Whereas if it's obtained between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m., the chance of dying is less than 3%. So why would that be? No, it's not circadian rhythm. It's because if your blood is drawn at 3 o'clock in the morning, it means that the doctor is extremely worried about you. Drawing um, doctors, contrary to some opinions, is, are not sadists, and they will not choose to draw blood at 3 o'clock in the morning unless they're extremely worried about you. And so, rather than treating that variance as noise, as some data scientists will, and this is part of the problem of not treating clinical data from a knowledge-based perspective, understanding how the data was actually obtained, if you didn't know that, you treat all, the, all that variance that you see on this um, screen as noise. But in fact, it's a very, very informative signal and it's biased. So if you treat as noise, you'll, you'll run uh, aground uh, in some wrong conclusions. Whereas if you understand that there's on the one side patient phys a pathophysiology, but also superimposed what we call healthcare system dynamics, which is the behavior of the healthcare system, including informed doctors trying to do the right thing, then only by combining these two, uh, these two signals will you actually have a good understanding of how this relates to the patient. And in fact, if you see on this graph, on the x-axis is the odds ratio of death, on the y-axis is how much of the um, signal is um, rel related to the um, lab test itself, you can see that there are many, many lab tests, many, many lab tests, where merely having the, knowing that the test was obtained gives you a prediction of higher mortality. Of course, when you combine it, combine the lab value with the health system dynamics, the fact that it was drawn at these uh, particular times, then you have an even better signal. Next, I'm going to go on to how can clinical data 
be used to clarify diagnostic boundaries. This is work done by Finale Doshi, was a postdoc with me and uh, had the, uh, finished at MIT with a PhD in computer science and now is uh, at Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences uh, as a uh, assistant professor of computer science. And when I approached her about the fact that I was actually bothered by the fact that some pediatricians, when they were told by the mothers that these kids with autism, that their children, the, the mothers would say, had these bowel problems and they were, they were told by the pediatrician, uh, brain bad, tummy hurts. And that's not my words, that's a verbatim quote. And so what Finale did was a very nice data-driven approach using the clinical data obtained from many electronic health records using the distributed query system called Shrine that goes over many I2B2 systems. For, but I don't want to distract you with how we got the data. Suffice it to say, we had data on thousands of individuals with autism. And what Finale did is she created a bit vector for each of these patients, uh, chunked into uh, well, one, one vector for each six-month block all the way to 15 years. And each bit in the bit vector describes whether that child would have one of 5,000 uh, different diagnoses in that six-month block. So you can think of each block, a six-month block, as having 5,000 bits on and on uh, for, for uh, 15 years. And so when she did that and applied a uh, unsupervised clustering algorithm to uh, these patient longitudinal data obtained from the electronic health record, what she found was quite interesting. What she found was one group with a lot of epilepsy, uh, greater than 80% epilepsy, as opposed to the background rate of 20% epilepsy in autism, in general autism. She found another subgroup with a lot of uh, infections, like hepatitis media and uh, sinusitis. And, although it's not shown here, it was statistically significant, but not prevalent enough to make it onto the graph, a number of autoimmune diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's ulcerative colitis, and uh, type 1 diabetes. And then there was a third uh, subgroup with um, ADHD, so ADHD, um, anxiety, and not shown here, but it, uh, for similar reasons. It was not frequent enough, but it was significant, um, schizophrenia, and uh, major depress depression. So what you have here are three very distinct biologies, three very distinct clinical courses of three populations that if you just labeled them as autism and did a case control with them, you would be mixing different uh, biologies as in the heart failure example I gave you earlier on. So that's saying that clinical data may in fact help us separate these underlying diagnoses, and note that we used an unsupervised method to define from a data-driven perspective what might be the distinct subgroups there. And can we do similar things in bi using biology and genes? So for example, with uh, uh, Dr. Nazine, who at the time was a graduate student in Bonnie Berger's group at MIT, we did a study looking at gene expression in one of the pathways that um, we had uncovered in that earlier autism expression study that I told you about, um, namely the innate immune pathway. And so we took the uh, KEG innate immune pathway and we set across a whole bunch of diseases that, have, uh, that are shown on the right, we published this in genome biology, to what extent are these genes dysregulated in these different diseases. As you can see here, there's quite a lot of overlap. But a way to perhaps quantify it better is to just ask, how does this, um, how does gene expression just in that pathway classify all those different diseases? And although it, it's not at the level of uh, clinical um, actionability, what you do see here is that all of uh, those diseases can be uh, classified somewhat effectively with errors on the curve uh, statistically different from random, and some of them quite a bit so, 
um, just on based on that innate immune pathway. So that tells us there's a lot of biological overlap between these different uh, diseases. And that's important not only for classification, but thinking about not only the mechanism of disease, but how you're going to treat it and perhaps repurpose drugs that are used to treat one disease to another disease. And really ask the question, for example, in the psychiatric diseases, psych uh, psychiatrists are very uh, fast to acknowledge that there is fairly significant overlap in the symptomatology of these different diseases. And because, as I've, I hope, convinced you, there is a lot of financial uh, incentives for, to have different diagnoses, as well as a lot of personal incentives to have different diagnoses, you can better appreciate how some of these psychiatric diseases, such as autism, or I should say neurodevelopmental diseases, such as autism, when there was a reclassification of the reclassification of autism in the DSM-5 manual, there was a enormous furor nationwide. And on the one hand, I, I want to smile because I often tease Mark Newson about how arcane some of his work on ontologies are. But in this case, the ontology of the DSM-5 was making the front page of many newspapers because it was so important how patients were being piled into that um, different diagnoses. But note that what happens when you pile individuals into this categorical diagnosis, it causes different financial and social effects to be uh, met. And the claim that I hope I'm beginning to uh, bolster is that from a data-driven perspective, we can do a far more uh, transparent and robust job of defining what actually constitutes uh, these diseases. So as I've argued just now, there's implications for study and for treatment. You might want to study not all autisms compared to, let's say, neurotypical individuals, but pick a subgroup that are much more biologically similar to one another, just as you would for heart failure. And if you went to a genetics-first approach, it would not be apparent that these uh, uh, diseases, that these, there are these subsets. So the signal is just not strong enough from a genetics-first or genetics-only approach. And clinicians might, might miss it because even if you had a huge practice of autism, you might easily miss uh, the fact that there was this overrepresentation of, uh, let's say, inflammatory bowel disease. Because even if you had a lifetime practice of 1,000 children with autism, which, by the way, that would be a phenomenally large practice, you probably wouldn't expect to have more than 10 individuals with inflammatory bowel disease. So over a lifetime, you might just ascribe that to random bad luck. And then I just want to emphasize again the unsupervised nature of the example I gave you about clustering the electronic health records versus the self-referential and circular uh, supervised labeling. Because if we start with a definitional categorical um, diagnosis, we're going to be stuck with all the consequences of that. Which, by the way, if we use artificial intelligence techniques, as we're beginning to do, such as deep learning against images, but we're using as the gold standard our categorical uh, diagnoses, we're in some sense going to be limiting the efficacy with this big data of our uh, diagnostic support because these big data um, algorithms, algorithms will be limited to the supposed gold standard um, definitions through this supervised learning. And so, again, what I'm trying to argue for is let's look at longitudinal large data sets on populations to drive much in a much more um, objective way what constitutes our diagnoses. And I also want to argue to, for a multimodal first exploration that is not necessarily just going phenotype first or genetics first, but as many people on this phone call have, in fact, in their own work illustrated, going at both 
in that case, both modalities, but if there are more than two, in multiple modalities at the same time. And in our modern machine learning frameworks, there are no theoretical reasons, at least, why we should not do that. What about when there is no diagnosis? How can we use clinical data and big data, perhaps, to, uh, to get there? So this is where I'm very uh, proud, actually, to describe my involvement in something called the Undiagnosed Disease Network, which is a um, offshoot from the very successful Undiagnosed Disease Program at the NIH, and where we said, um, and I'm, I'm a PI on the uh, Coordinating Center, where we conceived of this uh, network as being cloud-hosted, where all the data, all the genomic data would be uh, stored in the cloud, where all the uh, clinical data would be stored in the cloud. And those of you who are involved with human uh, study subjects trials will recognize that it was a major achievement for us to get all seven academic health centers, including the NIH, to agree to a single protocol that uh, A, said that they would go with this uh, shared data resource, that everybody within the network would be able to see the data. And furthermore, a patient could be referred into this network and then go wherever they needed to be referred to within this network. So going from one hospital to a completely different hospital system, something that does not happen usually. So by doing this, by taking these patients who have had already prior to their application to this network, a Hajira through multiple healthcare systems trying to get a diagnosis, we were able to therefore um, obtain genome, whole genome sequencing or exome sequencing, phenotypic uh, evaluation and coding per the HPO terminology, and referring these patients to the uh, right academic uh, health centers where the right individual can evaluate them. I should point out in this network we also have, um, so we have two sequencing centers, we also have um, a biological validation, because you, you can appreciate that many mutations that look like there are going to be loss of function often don't have uh, create loss of function. So there's a Drosophila and a zebrafish uh, core where using CRISPR they knock in the uh, human uh, mutation equivalent uh, into these organisms to see if it causes a phenotype so we can better assess uh, the pathogenicity of these variants. And the point is based on the approach that was pioneered at the UDP, we're finding that we're making now a lot of diagnoses. And this is now out of date. We have received well over, I think, 1,100 applications, uh, and over uh, 500 or 600 are under review, and um, actually over 500 uh, participants have been accepted, and I think on the order of 80 new diagnoses have been made. So when there's no diagnosis, what we're doing now is if there's a high probability causal variant, we're going to link, and as we have for, I think, on the order of 80 patients, uh, this, a new diagnostic label linking the clinical findings in that patient to that variant. But I think we have to be vigilant because do all individuals with that variant have disease? I think the, the probands that we've identified do have a causal link uh, from that variant to that uh, disease. But how does genetic background, in other words, individuals with different genetic background and different environmental uh, exposures, have a phenotype that's affected by that variant? And another way I can say it is we know intuitively and mathematically the probability of disease given a variant is not the same thing as the probability of variant given the disease. But in practice, we don't behave as, we, as if we know this. And so for a long time, there was a uh, number of uh, variants in the HFE gene which were considered to be pathogenic for hemochromatosis. And indeed, if you look at hereditary hemochromatosis clinics, 80% of individuals in those clinics will have uh, one of a small number of uh, variants in the H HFE uh, mutations in the HFE gene. But then um, a study was done, an amazing study was done at Kaiser Permanente by researchers from Scripps 
where they genotyped, uh, I believe it was over 44,000 uh, individuals with hemochromatosis. And they found, I think, 151 who were homozygous for one of those uh, known mutations. And of those 151, only one had any clinical evidence or family history of hemochromatosis. So the penetrance went from 80% in the hereditary hemochromatosis clinic to uh, less than 1%. And that's because the individuals at Kaiser had very different, um, very different uh, genetic backgrounds and very different exposures. And in case uh, that doesn't convince you, some other papers which looked at um, three different mouse strains with, HF, with the HFE uh, mutation, uh, of those mouse strains, only one of the three mouse strains shown any, showed evidence of hemochromatosis. So the point is, we are making these new diagnoses in the um, undiagnosed disease network, but we have to be careful not to make the same error. And the way to avoid making that same error is going to be um, the emergence of all these large-scale population uh, screening, uh, sorry, geno genomic sequencing, which will give us what are the probabilities of those variants in the general population so that we can have a better sense of how they are linked to health and disease. So uh, in closing, I'm going to ask the following question. Why is medicine so dependent on categorical, categorical diagnoses? Um, well, there was a question that was asked in the New England Journal of Medicine 33 years ago. They basically asked, I mean, they literally asked, if you have a disease that's one in 1,000, and you have a test that has a sensitivity of, sensitivity of 100% and have a specificity of 95%. So those are very good looking, that's a very good looking test. 100% sensitive, 95%, 95% specific. Very few genetic tests can even approach that level of performance. So in, with this one in 1,000 uh, disease, if, what's, your prob, what's the probability of, ha of having the disease if you're test positive for, in that test? And a bunch of Harvard doctors and students were asked this 33 years ago and, and reported upon in the New England Journal. And about half the doctors uh, answered greater than 90% and half the doctors answered around 1% to 2%. And just for those of you who are falling asleep, I'll just remind you that the right answer is, so if you have 1,000 individuals, one will be a true positive because it's a 1 in 1,000 disease. And you'll have, because it's 95% specific, you'll have five. 50 uh, false positives, so you'll have 51 positives total, only one of them are true, so that if you test a positive on that genetic test with those remarkable characteristics, nonetheless your chance of having the disease is less than 2%. 33 years, 33 years later, we ran the same test on, on Harvard doctors and students, um, and we essentially found exactly the same distribution, uh, but because we were using the same, <laughs> same question, uh, we didn't publish in the England Journal, but in JAMA Internal Medicine. And so <clears throat> my point is this. Human beings are not good probabilistic uh, machines. Uh, we don't have, uh, we're not many uh, Bayesian, uh, Bayesian machines intuitively. And therefore, having a categorical diagnosis is, is really cognitively necessary for us. But that creates a real problem when we're entering this age of millions of genetic tests. How are we going to uh, navigate the fact that we're not natural Bayesian machines. So I will now summarize so that I can get to uh, any questions. Our addiction to categorical, categorical diagnoses is cognitively useful and will likely continue for that reason. But categorical diagnosis can result in spurious biological and clinical inference, and it's often manipulated for dollars or for a non-pecuniary secondary agenda. I want to point out and remind us that the prediction of diagnostic, diagnostic class does not necessarily provide evidence of biological etiology, and I hope I've begun to convince you at least that diagnoses are more robust when they're data-driven, when you formally model health system dynamics for clinically acquired data, that is statistically informed, that in the spirit of the precision medicine report, when it's multimodal, when you're looking at more than one data type at a time, you're actually going to do better, and to avoid circularity of uh, this uh, diagnostic categorical problem, having it unsupervised uh, rather than 
or lightly supervised approach rather than a fully supervised approach may be advisable. And because, the first point, because of the cognitive utility of categorical diagnoses, I think we have very little choice at this point other than to recognize the necessity of having computational decision support that will actually uh, substitute for our non-Bayesian uh, uh, wetware with uh, computational uh, software and hardware that does, in fact, do the appropriate probabilistic assessment of post-test uh, probability of various uh, disease combinations. And with that, I want to thank you for your patience and thank my collaborators for their uh, work. And I'll stop here and I'll see if there are any questions. Um, and I leave it to uh, Mark to be uh, Master of Ceremonies. Uh, thank you, Zach. That was a great talk. I really appreciate that, as do all the people listening uh, on the webinar. Uh, as you know, there is a box uh, where you can type in your questions, and what I will do is try to synthesize and restate the questions so we can have a little bit of order as we uh, ask Zach to expound on some of the issues that he's, he's raised uh, today. Uh, so please think about your questions, put them into the question box, and while you're doing that, let me, let me ask Zach, you, you've raised lots of issues about the messiness with which we categorize disease, with the messiness with which we record data, uh, basically with all the complexities of, of, of clinical information. And I'm just wondering, what are the implications of all that for elect electronic health records? If we could start from scratch, how would you design an EHR to accommodate all of this? Well, first of all, um, I want to paint the um, a positive version of that. So the same the same uh, argument can be made about claims data. So claims data are comprehensive, so they don't have ascertainment bias, but they're certainly biased for financial gain, and they're certainly more coarse-grained than many uh, EHRs. But uh, smart and uh, meticulous individuals have been able to use the claims data to answer real questions by combining, in various creative, probabilistic fashion, different uh, claims codes to identify the right patient populations. Similarly, I will say that you can use, perhaps using some of the methods I referred to, but not necessarily, you can actually go against the existing meta, uh, messy data, codified data, in a variety of ways to obtain some probabilistic estimates of what the underlying uh, true patient clusters are. But to answer your question directly, if I were uh, perhaps at Google, which I'm not, uh, I might argue that, uh, dear ontologists, we wipe the floor with you regularly just by doing brute force uh, machine learning, uh, statistical machine learning over the uh, textual corpora. And we actually never fully, um, not until the very end, do we do any uh, labeling of ontologies, but we actually calculate patient similarity across, for example, all the um, word vectors across all these patients. And so I would say that I would not redesign uh, the EHRs from scratch because we've already spent several billion dollars. And, but I would perhaps, in addition to being optimistic on how we can use with the codified data, I think there is a much more modern uh, statistical framework to look at the clinical notes that will be quite helpful. Ironically, actually, some of the cut and paste facilities in the EHRs will actually take away from some of the uh, signal in these clinical notes because, of course, people like cutting and pasting, but it, of course, takes away a lot of signal from uh, the, the richness that normally is in uh, human text. Thanks. Uh, while, while we're uh, going through questions, if you could, uh, there's a request to put up your conclusion slide again so people can take a look at those bullet points. All righty. You can just back up your slide. And a question from, from an ontology lover. What is your advice to librarians working with EMR, Biobank, REDCap groups, et cetera, given our tendency to categorize? Uh, how can we help our patrons think and plan for a new paradigm? Uh, we work with researchers, physicians who contribute to the classification and reclassification efforts of diseases. Um, what would you tell these people? So I'll tell them two things. First of all, a very tactical thing you can do is to say, why don't you have your, your researchers at least analyze 
in two ways. The way they originally did it, but then use some use a set of um, categorizations that uh, lump together similar things relatively robustly, like FIWAS codes. So FIWAS codes uh, were developed at Vanderbilt in order for them to be able to look at different diseases because, of course, ICD-9 does not do uh, a great job of maintaining that kind of uh, hierarchy. But even FIWAS itself is insufficient. But I would say that if we use that or whatever ontology Mark you would, because uh, you're far more experienced than I am, would point to. But I found that FIWAS codes, by the way, are actually quite useful in rolling it up. You can see whether it's it's a robust uh, finding, a robust association, a robust cluster, rather than just a um, an artifact of the ontology. The harder way to do it, but the one that's I think much more uh, consonant with our BD2K. Uh, Spirit is to actually use the primary data itself and say, first, let's cluster the data by the primary, primary data, perhaps principal component analysis or some other uh, dimensional analogy reduction technique to see if these patients that we've labeled certainly in a certain way, in fact, cluster together. Because that will give you a good smell test whether the categorization that you're using is, in fact, robust relative to the question you're asking. Uh, there's a, an interesting corollary question that comes from Jim Cimino. Uh What are the implications for race as a demographic? Um, I think that's uh, it's. This is a very very tough one because I think I showed you uh, how uh, not doing this in one way created a lot of problems, and so we're we're stuck with the following. On the the good news used to be that self-identified race. Um, correlates well with what the EHR thinks your race is. In other words, um, in other words, administrators are tracking patients somewhat. The problem is that that's not going to work as well as we become an increasingly multiracial society. And uh, so I think that what we're going to have to start doing is using um, different modalities depending on what the purpose is. So if you really want to find continent of origin, probably looking at a few hundred SNPs, and that's all it takes these days, just a few hundred SNPs have been identified uh, that give fairly reliable continent or of origin and will give you the mixture of continent of origin. Those of, you who, those of you who've used 23andMe can see that. And I think that's the answer, by the way, of how we will ca have to categorize patients. And so if you want to do a case control study, I think um, as, we, as has been done in, in population genetics now for a long time, but not in clinical medicine, we'll have to compare uh, populations on those, um, uh, on those uh, ge uh, genetic backgrounds as determined by the SNPs. But that only satisfies a certain class of Questions. There are other class questions that are still going to be much more informed by uh, what your identification is, and that's a much more complicated story, and I'm sure we could have, and perhaps should have, a much longer discussion about it. Uh, another questioner wants to know, what are the implications for gender and sex, uh, given that we're moving into an era where gender and sex are not viewed as binary classifications? Well, speaking as a, a pediatric endocrinologist, uh, I think that's uh, an, a very good question. And certainly, um, just having uh, the male and female um, genders on the electronic health record, uh, for the most part, uh, is not very helpful in uh, supporting that diagnosis. Now, I know that the, diagnose, uh, the, the EHRs have changed recently. Uh, to support that a multiplicity of um, gender assignments, but uh, or gender assignments, but it's not clear how they're being informed, whether by the patient, by the clinician, and so if we want to use this for studies, I think <laughs> uh, somebody is going to have to come together and decide um, how we're going to represent it in a way that reflects both and maybe simultaneously. 
uh, biological measurements and patient uh, identity because we recognize that there is in gender, in uh, this identity, there is your, what your uh, sexual organs look like, what your chromosomal uh, arrangement looks like, where your mutations are affecting or not different uh, hormones that are associated with different traditional gender identities. And so, again, I think that part, there's a purely biological part of this that I think we can and should capture in EHRs. But then there's also the uh, self-identification part, which I know is complicated, but I think also does inform us about some aspects of the patient that we have to also figure out how to capture in the EHR, and I'm not clear that we have, we've done that yet. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Zach, we've reached the end of the hour, and I want to thank you for a really illuminating talk. If you look at the questions uh, that are still posted, you'll see a number of uh, listeners have uh, basically just at posted a, a thank you because this is such a, a stimulating conversation. really want to thank you for your contribution, and thank everyone who dialed in today. Thank you very much for your, your attention.